Okay, so some of you guys got this lecture on Commander-in-Chief in class, but other bells did not. So I'm going to go ahead and record this. And for those of you who didn't uh, get it, you can watch it now. And for those of you who did and you want to see it again and slow it down, it's online. You can watch it. Um, the President's role as Commander-in-Chief comes directly from the Constitution. And it puts him in charge of the military. And that's a pretty big job. Right now we've got 1.3 million troops stationed around the world in different places. We also have troops in combat who are actively fighting in seven different countries. So this is a, a pretty big job um, for the president and it comes directly from the Constitution. Um, it makes him the head of the military. Uh, he gives the orders to the generals, the admirals, to, to everybody. Um, they have to follow his orders, follow his lead. And so we've had some president who's, presidents who have been generals. If you think about George Washington, he was a general. Um, Andrew Jackson was a general in uh, the War of 1812. Um, Eisenhower, Grant. Um, we've had presidents with generals who have big time military experience who then uh, become in charge of the military as president. We've had other presidents who are junior officers. Uh, they were in the military, but not particularly high ranking. Um, Kennedy was an officer during um, World War II. Um, Carter was on a submarine. Um, so you've had some presidents, a lot of presidents with some military experience, but who weren't that high up. And then you've had other presidents, um, Trump, Obama, Clinton, who didn't have any military experience at all. And despite that, they're in charge of the military. They get to tell the generals and the admirals what to do and what not to do. And you could look at it both ways. Um, on the one hand, you would think it was good to have a president who's a general because he knows the military and um, understands what he needs to understand and can make the right decisions for it because he's been in the military for so long. Um, on the other people, other hand, some people would argue that a president who's been in the military, particularly high up, might look at things too much through a military lens, not enough through a political lens, and take all the different factors into account, not just what's best for the military. So you could argue it either way, what's better as far as how much military experience a president should have. The way it works in the Constitution, and this is important, the president doesn't get to declare war. Uh, the Congress does that. The Congress declares war, and the president then is in, is in charge of the military and making the decisions to, to prosecute the war. Sort of like Congress collects taxes, but the president uh, collects them. Congress declares war, and then the president uh, executes the war, makes the decisions to try to win the war. And when the Constitution was written back in 1787, that made a lot of sense because things moved more slowly. Congress had time to debate whether or not to go to war. Then once they did, they could hand it over to the president. He, he could make uh, the decisions about the military and moving troops and where to attack and things like that. It doesn't work that way today. It's harder because things move so quickly. If uh, we find out that a plane is on the way to attack us, uh, Congress doesn't have time to debate about what to do about it. Somebody's got to make a really quick call. And so presidents have taken on sort of more and more power with the military, despite what this says. We have not officially declared war since World War II back in the 1940s. We were in, at war in Korea, in Vietnam. Uh, we've had all sorts of uh, you know, combat around the world in different places, but we've never declared war since the 1940s, uh, which to some people is a little bit troubling. Other people will look at it and say, well, here's, here's how we have to do it. Um, in the 1960s, things sort of came to a head because President Johnson was uh, the president. He sent um, hundreds of thousands of American troops over to Vietnam, and he did it without any kind of a declaration of war from Congress. And 50,000 American troops died. And uh, Congress, after that war was over in the 70s, said, you know what, we need, to, uh, we need to get back in the game. We've given too much power to the president. We sort of let the president uh, just send troops without questioning it, without uh, authorizing it. So Congress passed this law in 1973. It's called the War Powers Resolution. And what it says is that the president can do whatever he needs to do for 60 days. If there's an emergency or a short-term need, we're gonna give the president the authority to do what he needs to do or someday she for 60 days. But after 60 days, the, if the president sends troops into combat, it has to stop unless Congress specifically declares war or approves of it in some other way. So the president has a 60-day window to do what he needs to do, but after that, he needs Congress's approval. Um, so it's kind of a compromise between the specifics of the Constitution, Congress declares war, president then executes the war, 
and the realities of today's world where things move a lot quicker than, than they used to. Um, some examples of how we've sort of worked that out since that law was passed in 1973. So for example, 1989, Bush won attacks Panama. Um, we took out the dictator there. We didn't want him in charge anymore. We took him out, we arrested him, attacked Panama, and then brought troops home in less than 60 days. So the War Powers Act never really came into play because it was all over in less than 60 days. He did what he needed to do. The military did what they needed to do. It was all over within 60 days. So Congress never got to weigh in. And some of you, if you've been on the Stry trip, there's a drive that you take pretty frequently from Gamboa, where Guido's house is, into Panama City. And on the way on that drive, on the right, sometimes they'll point out to you, well, this is the prison where our former dictator Noriega uh, was held for years and years until he died. Uh, that's the dictator that uh, the U.S. took out, arrested, um, and so he was in that jail for years. Um, another example. Um, President Bush number two in 2003 decided he needed to attack the country of Iraq. Among other things, he said that uh, they had weapons of mass destruction and we needed to, to get in there before they used them. Um, he never found them. But what he did is he, he knew it was going to take longer than 60 days and he got pre-approval from Congress. So he was okay under the Constitution, under the War Powers Act also, because Congress approved beforehand. It's, it wasn't an official declaration of war, but it basically said the president can do what he needs to do um, as far as Iraq. Um, one last example. In 2002, Congress passed a resolution that said the president, whoever he is, not only the current president, which was Bush number two, but future presidents, can do whatever they need to do to go after the people who perpetrated 9-11. And that is still in place. And so uh, almost all, I think all of the countries where we are in combat, which is seven, uh, the president's authorization comes from this because he said, well, these are sort of remnants or successors to Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda committed 9-11. This is who Al-Qaeda is now, what they've morphed into, whether it's ISIS or something else. So that's where the president gets the power to take these actions, even though there hasn't been a formal declaration of war. Uh, a lot of people have um, a problem with that. They think that's lasted too long. It's gotten too, too indirect and too vague and too much time has passed. But as of now, that's how the actions that Obama and Trump have engaged in as presidents, that's how they have um, that's how they've justified it by this 2002 authorization. Okay, we're going to look uh, very briefly at um, Obama as commander-in-chief and sort of some of the things that, that he did as commander. Uh, one thing that he did, and President Bush had started this before he came into office and Obama completed it, is he pulled troops out of Iraq. Um, they were still there from 2003 when we had attacked them, and he got a lot of them um, out. He was pressured at various times during his administration by some people to get involved in the civil war in Syria and also within the, the civil war going on in Ukraine or the war between Ukraine and Russia and Ukraine and also to engage in some sort of a military strike against Iran. 
He didn't do any of those things. He decided it was best for us to stay out, and that's the decision of the commander-in-chief as well, not only when to put troops in, but also when to keep them out. Um, on the other hand, Obama used a lot of drones um, to attack uh, other countries, people in other countries, terrorists in other countries. A drone is an unmanned aircraft, and so under Obama, the use of conventional troops went way, way down, but the use of drones went way, way up. And uh, that was a way that he thought that we could uh, go after the people we needed to go after, um, but do it in a way that minimized loss of American life. And what he also did a lot more of than previous presidents is the use of uh, special forces, meaning like a SEAL team or a Green Beret or something like that. Some kind of special forces, a small group that goes in to do one sort of individual task. Like for example, um, when the SEAL team went in and killed Osama bin Laden. Uh, that's an example of that. So as a commander in chief, um, Obama was not big on sort of conventional troops on the ground fighting a conventional war, a conventional fight, but he was big on uh, drone strikes. He was big on drone strikes and also sending in special forces to, to complete a particular mission. So let me put something up on the board. Okay, so what you can see there is uh, active theaters of U.S. military involvement in 2009 when Obama um, became president. And so you can see basically three countries. We were involved actively in Iraq, Afghanistan, and then we had drone strikes uh, going on in um, Pakistan. Um, if you move it, And then you look at 2016. What we've got is fewer conventional troops out there fighting, but we're fighting in more places in kind of a small way. So we're still in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan. We're also now, uh, to some extent, special forces in Syria. We've got drone strikes in Yemen and Somalia. We've got a few forces on the ground in Africa. So we're in more places, but with fewer, um, fewer men. Uh, fewer men and women, I should say. Uh, so that shows the budget under both Bush and Obama. Um, Bush number two on the left, Obama on the right. And you can see that the budget was slightly higher um, uh, in billions of dollars, uh, but not a huge difference between the two. What you can also see there is U.S. casualties and overseas conflicts. And on the left is President Bush, and you can see um, up over 4,000 casualties um, for Bush, a lot of that because of his decision to attack Iraq. You can see how it was less than half under Obama um, because uh, he, he didn't like the conventional forces and he got a lot of them off the ground. On the other hand, you can see here drone strikes launched by administration on the left. You can see that uh, Bush was way, way under 100. On the other hand, Obama was up uh, close to 500 um, uh, during his presidency. So you can see what a, uh, what a big uh, advocate of drone power that he was. Part of that is because technology was better, but part of that is because that's just what he favored. Um, and then if you can read, you can't read at the bottom, but I can tell you it says Obama has embraced special operations forces. Um, in 2014, U.S. special operations forces deployed to 133 countries or 70% of the world. Um, so he was a big special forces guy as well.
Okay, on the other hand, um, President Trump, as Commander-in-Chief. Uh, the few troops that we did have in Syria, he is uh, in the process of pulling them out. Uh, the group that we've been fighting in Afghanistan ever since 9-11 is called the Taliban. Just in the last week or two, he's reached a, an agreement with the Taliban to pull out of Afghanistan to get a lot of our troops um, to, come, to come back. If you remember a few months ago, I think that's spelled incorrectly, but he ordered the attack on the Iranian military leader, um, Soleimani. Um, they killed that, but at the same time, when a lot of people thought that we were going to end up in a war with Iran, he didn't. They had that one strike on our base, but he decided not to respond. Um, and we've also, he's kind of sort of talked a lot about North Korea being a problem um, as far as their nuclear testing, but to this point we haven't done anything there either. So if anything, what, uh, th these are the two big things that he's done, is he's really tried to get a lot of troops to come uh, back home as Commander-in-Chief. If you've got any questions about this, uh, feel free to email me later and I will get right back to you.